So I'm, I'm walking along a rocky coastline, balancing on these large, you know, red-hued blocks of sandstone. I turn to face west, and I can feel the wind shifting suddenly. It was a little bit windy this morning out of the southwest, but now I can feel the storm growing from the north. In the 10 or 15 minutes it takes me to scramble along the rocks back to the main camp, the waves have gotten menacing. I see these, these five-foot rollers breaking over the front and the sides of this small boat that we have moored off the landing. So I, I get to the landing, I, I strip down and jump in the water. I think if I can get the boat just moved out a little bit further on its mooring line, it can ride out this storm in relative safety. But it's taking a lot of water, you know, so I grab onto the front and I get pulled up out of the water as the, as the boat gets lifted by this big wave in the air. And I come crashing down nearly underneath the bow. This happens over and over and over. It takes me the better part of an hour, but I, I get the boat moved a little bit out on the mooring line, but a lot of water has laid it low. So with the next wave, I, I get up and I pull myself into the boat and start bailing it out furiously, but I get this feeling in my gut that I've already lost. More water is coming in than I can, I can bail out, so I, I take out the life jackets, I detach the gas tank from the outboard motor and take anything that would float away and scramble ashore, setting it aside. I run back out into the water and I try to hold the boat up just with my arms, but I get, you know, it's just filling up with water and I'm face to face with it as it completely fills with water and capsizes. I'm spent and I'm shivering. I've just had this small battle with Lake Superior and I've lost. This is a story that happened on Rabbit Island. This is Rabbit Island. You know, I, I ended up Going back out into the water, the, it calmed, the Lake Superior calmed down, and things worked out okay in the end, but I'll first introduce myself. I'm Andrew Ranville, and while I'm originally from Michigan, I've spent the last six and a half years living and working as an artist in London, the United Kingdom. In my youth, I'd, I'd explore the urban and suburban terrain on my skateboard. I'd climb trees and go camping in northern Michigan with my family. But over the past, past several years, I've had an amazing opportunity to work on some international projects, whether that be building treehouse installations in remote areas of Finland, or building sculptures in new exhibition spaces, spaces in China, or climbing seven of the tallest mountains in North Africa, not once, but twice. But the journey of my arts practices brought me back to Michigan, to Rabbit Island and Lake Superior. Lake Superior, a lot of us here probably know it pretty well. So I would like to go back and tell you how the things worked out with the boat. They worked out okay in the end. Uh, I was able to recover the outboard motor, which had shaken loose from the transom and sunk to the bottom. And as a wave calms down, um, Mark, uh, Mark this, this, our mainland connection, who had so graciously lent us the boat, you know, I felt horrible what had happened. But Scott, his brother, was able to come to the island a day later and help get the boat running again. It's no small miracle. But Scott, he works small miracles on a regular basis, whether like stopping by the island at the perfect moment with an extra lake trout for our campfire, or delivering a, homemade, a jar of homemade thimbleberry jam. But you guys probably have some questions, so we should probably go through the W's. What is Rabbit Island? Rabbit Island is a 90-acre forested island located in Lake Superior, which is the largest freshwater lake in the world. It's an intact parcel of land. It's amazingly avoided development and subdivision. Over 100 years ago, it was, it was homesteaded briefly by a Swedish immigrant named Berg. But now Rabbit Island's an idea. It's a platform for a creative output and research. Where is Rabbit Island? Well, Rabbit Island's not too far away from where we are right now. It's this forested fold that juts up out of Lake Superior, about three miles east of the middle of Michigan's Keweenaw Peninsula. Some of you here may have even passed by it on boat. Some of you might know it as Traverse Island, as it's often named on nautical charts and maps. Who is Rabbit Island? This is Rob Gorski and myself suffering from another outtake from our crowdfunding campaign video. Rob has strong family ties to the area, and he purchased the island in 2010 with conservation in mind. He worked with the Keweenaw Land Trust to put a conservation easement on the land, ensuring that the ecosystem would remain protected in perpetuity. But who else is Rabbit Island? There's the 192 Kickstarter backers who helped successfully fund our crowdfunding campaign from 12 different countries. The camp campaign raised nearly $15,000 to help establish the residency program. There's also the thousands of, thousands of other online followers who continue to share our story and contribute to the discussion. 
And then we can't forget the direct collaborators, the people who come to the island in person. They either lend a hand or work on their own projects and research. But now for the most important W, why is Rabbit Island? The, the fact that it exists is why. You know, a chance to invest in and protect a space like this is an amazing opportunity. The fact that it's intact, we celebrate that and we take inspiration from it. Similar places are all too few, even on the mainland. We wonder how our land use, energy use, food systems, design and culture can be shaped within its size and its remoteness, these unique constraints. I could go on you know, and tell you in detail about just the things we've done in the past two summers, and I could go on for hours more about what we have planned just for the two summers after. But I want to take this moment just to explain you know, my experience on the island and what I've learned so far. I was on the island for nearly a month uh, in the summer of 2011. This is a period of research and exploration, and I had done a lot of work just exploring the island. I had volunteered myself through the Kickstarter campaign as the first artist in residence. So it was my job to not only see if the artist residency program could work, but to actually help build the infrastructure which en would enable future artists in residence. So it was a period of a lot of sweat and sawdust. I helped complete the structure which we used for our main camp, which Rob and a small group of friends had started the year previous. After coming off the island, I had a meeting with Melissa Matusik, who's the director of the DeVos Art Museum at Northern Michigan University. The museum agreed to host an exhibition of my work the following summer, effectively creating a partnership between the residency program and the museum. This is, like a, this is a big step for us, because now all future resident artists would have an outlet and also be able to create a dialogue with the local community. I returned to the island in the summer of 2012, but this time for two months. I continued working on a series of photographs I'd begun the previous summer. I did a lot more exploring. I mapped the island as diligently as possible. I made installations, temporary installations on the island out of uh, materials the island offered, such as wind-felled trees, peeled logs, driftwood, and stone. There's a lot more sweat and a lot more sawdust. But in the end, I had an exhi exhibition full of completely new work. And with the museum, we published a special map and a catalog and also an artifact kit. The artifact kit, we worked with two local conservation organizations to help raise money and also um, so, you know, spread the message about their uh, activities on the Cubanaw Peninsula and Lake Superior. The time on the island uh, made me really think and question some of my methodologies as an, as an artist, some of the ways I work. And the exhibition and you know the other things off the island it helped distill some ideas that I've I've been having over the first you know the past few years. I began to realize that not only artists but architects and designers and all those all people who create culture have the opportunity to consider the wider implications of their craft. These people are often the vanguard for social change. I mean, look how they revitalize, reinvent, and repurpose the failed or forgotten parts of our cities and urban areas. Berlin, Bushwick, East London, Detroit, what about Rabbit Island? How can those forces be applied to the idea that wilderness is civilization? How can those motivations for change in their immediate landscape be applied to remote island? But maybe more importantly, how can the island, the landscape of the island and the experiences had there, shape change and create motivations off the island? These realizations, I started to apply as lessons to my own, my own arts practice. And there's a few things, there's like five things that I've learned that I've you know, begun to apply both on the island when I work there and off the island. The first thing I've learned, you know, I've long lost this, uh, this need to identify myself as a sculptor or photographer. So this first lesson I learned was that adaptability is key. The artwork or project should dictate the medium, not the artist. The second thing I learned is that on a long enough timeline, all art is temporary. So we must be conscious and really thoughtful with ideas of permanence and impermanence. The third thing I learned is that the formal qualities need not compromise function, and functionality need not compromise form. So that's to say if an artwork is meant to do something, 
that shouldn't necessarily mean that it's invalidated as an artwork. And just because something is an artwork doesn't necessarily mean it can't have a function outside of the art world. The fourth thing I realize is that an arts practice should consider all externalities. And if it does not give back, then it should not take away. And the fifth thing I learned is that it should do all this using a language which is accessible to all people, not one that needs to be learned in art school by reading the latest critique. But maybe, maybe the most important thing I learned is that you can't control everything. So I think back to that time, when, that humbling experience in Lake Superior when I lost the boat beneath the waves. You know, did I try to do too much? Did, by moving it between the mooring lines, jumping in to bail out the water, um, did I interfere and doom the boat? If I didn't interfere, would it have rode out the storm? I can't say for sure, but I know something similar can be said for the participants of Rabbit Island. If we try to do too much on the island, surely the project will fail. But we should not hesitate to use the idea of the island as a framework, a catalyst for change, not only in art, but also living, sustainably both socially and ecologically. We're still learning. We're developing uh, systems and solutions for our, our land use, our energy use, food systems, um, and also just how to work sustainably out there, transportation to the island. And we really encourage all those who want to lend a hand or you know, voice a thought about the project to get in touch. Artists, architects, designers, engineers, biologists, writers, musicians, students, anybody who wants to join us on this journey. You know, we've, we've got a really amazing local support. We've got a global audience. And we've just begun to realize how far this story can reach. So we'll continue to be thoughtful, be restrained, and work sustainably, knowing that the ideas generated, experiences had, and lessons learned will much, reach much further than the wild shores of Rabbit Island. Thank you. <laughs>